Acts chapter 15. <clears throat> we're going to look at the apostolic letter and the results. So we're going to finally finish up the Jerusalem Council. So we'll look at their letter and the results. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. When they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles with the elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, It is necessary to, be, to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to the men and brethren, You know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God who knows the heart acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and will set it up. So that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his works. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Our first verse here, this is where we start today. Then it pleased the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch, with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, is also called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. And they wrote this letter by them, the apostles, the elders, and the brethren. To the brethren who are of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that some who went out from us troubled you with words, unsettling your soul, saying, You must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the sake of the Lord, for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who are also, who will also report the same things by word of mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, and from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these things, you will do well. Farewell. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When they had read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now Judas and Silas themselves, being prophets also, exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they had stayed there for a time, they, they were sent back with the greetings from the brethren to the apostles, saying, It seemed good to Silas to remain there. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. And then we'll stop there. And then they're going to go back. And then the second missionary journey will begin. And there's going to be a disagreement with Barnabas. He's going to leave. And he's going to take Silas or Silvanus on the second missionary journey. In our last study, we essentially concluded the Jerusalem Council's proceedings and decision. Today, we're going to look at the results. We begin with verse 22, which assumes that the council accepted the four recommendations that James presented to the assembly. Now, they're going to rearrange them in a more logical order. Three things dealing with food, and then one dealing with sexual immorality. So it's a different order, but they essentially adopt his recommendation. 
Then it pleased the apostles and elders of the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. Namely, Judas, as was named Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brethren. Well, there are a number of things to note about this verse first. The assembly came to a formal decision on what to do. The phrase, it seemed good, or it, then it pleased, the old King James, then it pleased, tote, a doxin, is a common idiom in Greek at the beginning of formal decrees. So to us in English, it sounds very informal, but it's actually a very formal decree. This indicates that a vote was taken on the matter, and this vote, we are told, uh, was unanimous. There was no disagreement. The English, it seemed good, gives the false impression that the decision was informal and pragmatic, but that's not true. Now, the agreement was probably done by a show of hands, as in 1423. So the vote included everything that follows. An assent to James' recommendations, they rearrange it though, sending a commission to Antioch with a letter that embodied the resolution, as well as the election of Judas and Silas, as members of the commission. And we'll see Silas uh, has a very important role to play in the second missionary journey. We must keep in mind the way Luke gives us, in a, he gives us a very abbreviated history. Uh, he tells us the essentials. Although Luke simply notes that it was resolved, it is likely that a number of separate votes were taken. <clears throat> Second, the men involved in the decision are noted. The apostles and elders with the whole church. Or simply in Greek, it's the apostles, the elders, and then comma, the brethren. The Greek indicates that the apostles, that the apostolic church had two distinct groups of leaders. In fact, in the Greek, this is uh, very clear. You have a definite article with two nouns. So they're in a separate class than the church, the brethren, even though they are brethren. The term applied to those especially chosen by Jesus, who had uh, the term apostle, who had extra or extraordinary gifts. Of course, they were prophets, but they had they were they were special. They had gifts that went above and beyond that of a prophet. And we see that working in miracles and so forth. Sometimes in Acts it is broader, the term apostle, and includes evangelists like Barnabas. He's called an evangelist earlier in the book of Acts. Then there were the elders. <clears throat> These are the overseers and pastors of various churches. Now later in the New Testament, we're going to see a clear distinction between teaching elders and ruling elders. That'll come later. Here, we just told elders, and we know from later part of the New Testament that, it, that obviously that included teachers, that included ruling elders, or governors. They're also called church governors. The expression with the whole church has been interpreted in two ways. Number one, it has been viewed as including all the representatives, that is the elders, from all the individual congregations throughout Jerusalem, not simply the mother church at Jerusalem. That's a very common interpretation. The apostles and elders are the representatives of the church and are not separate from it. When they act as a body, the church acts. They act in harmonious conjunction with the whole church. Okay, that's one view. And you can see the Presbyterians would like that view. Number two, the other view is that the proceedings and the vote were done publicly before a large group of church members from congregations in that area. And the church members happened to agree with the court's decision. They were in agreement with it. And I think this view is probably the likely view. It's probably the better view. And this is the view of Calvin, by the way. He writes this. 22, it pleased the apostles. That tempest was made calm, not without the singular grace of God, so that after the matter was thoroughly discussed, they did all agree together in sound doctrine. Also, the modesty of the common people is gathered by this, because after they had referred the matter to the judgment of the apostles and the rest of the teachers, they do now also subscribe to their decree. And on the other side, the apostles did show some token of their equity, <coughs> in that they set down nothing concerning the common cause of all the godly without admitting the people. For assuredly, this tyranny 
did spring from the pride of pastors, that those things which appertain unto the common state of the whole church are subject to people being excluded to the will, a I, I will not say lust of a few. He's talking about the Roman Catholic Church. We know that a hard matter, it is to suppress the slander of the wicked, to satisfy most men who are churlish and forward, to keep under the light and unskilled, to wipe away errors conceived, to heal up hatred, to appease contentions, and to abolish false reports. Per adventure, the enemies of Paul and Barnabas might have said that they had gotten letters by fair and flattering speeches. They might have invented some new cavell. The rude and weak might by and by have been troubled. But when chief men come up with the letters, that they may gravely dispute the whole matter in presence, all sinister suspicion is taken away. In other words, they did this, they did this whole thing in front of all the church members. They saw the debate. They saw the reasonings. They saw how it was proved from Scripture and so forth. And therefore, they had nothing to argue against. It was not done in secret. It was done out in the open. And we talked about how that is very, very important in a few sermons ago. Third, they decided to send qualified men to Antioch so they could convey and explain the deliberations and the ruling of the council. Antioch was the headquarters of the missionary labors to the Gentile world. And of course, as we've spoken before, it's strategically located. You go north into what is now Lebanon and a little to the right, and there it is. So it's the entrance, it's on the road to Asia Minor, which is modern Turkey, and it also goes up into Europe. And as we know, God was very concerned uh, with bringing the gospel to those areas at that time. <clears throat> It also is the place where the Judaizers made the attempt to integrate their heresy into the church. The council therefore saw the necessity to present the decision before that church and churches in that area to make sure this error was thoroughly defeated. Very biblical procedure. The council, which was composed of elders and apostles from both Antioch and the congregations in Jerusalem, made a unanimous decision. The argumentation and decision was made publicly before a large number of church members from Jerusalem. But very few church members from Antioch had been able to attend the meeting, if any. Once again, we want to note a few things about this procedure. Number one, and I just emphasize, I brought this up before, but we're emphasizing this. The judici judicial procedures of Christ church are to be conducted out in the open, not simply for transparency, and that's critical. And we discussed how presbyteries and sessions go into executive session to hide their corrupt, the way they do things in a very corrupt manner, like politicians behind closed doors smoking cigars. But so also the congregants may see how decisions are derived directly from the Bible, the Word of God. Church courts are founded on biblical exegesis, biblical interpretation, not raw power or arbitrary authority. Number two, the court wants the decisions carefully explained to the congregations they affect. They do not simply issue orders. They want church members to see the biblical why behind the decision. I see this is something that's also abused greatly today. Oh, we're the elders. Shut up and do what we say. No, this is our decision. This is why we've arrived at this decision from Scripture. Here is the biblical evidence for our decision. When elders are unwilling to do that, and a lot of times I've seen they are unwilling to do that, it's simply because they're corrupt and they know they don't have an argument. If there is to be genuine harmony between Jewish and Gentile believers, they need to be convinced from Scripture as to why the unity exists. The Roman Catholic Church <clears throat> has an external unity enforced by raw, arbitrary ecclesiastical power. Now, they really don't exercise that power much today, but, of course, if you publicly disagree with the bishops, you can be, uh, if you're a priest or something, you could probably be de defrocked. But within the church, there are dozens of factions within the Roman Catholic Church and different schools of thought. 
True unity can only grow out of decisions found on biblical exegesis or interpretation, not in arbitrary power or doctrinal pluralism. Because <clears throat> people think of the Roman Catholic Church as this monolithic thing with unity. No, it's not really. There's an external unity, but there's all different schools of thought, Thomism and Augustinianism, and then they have, they have this group and that group and this group of nuns and this group of that, all disagreeing, some being very liberal, some being very conservative. The men said were Paul and Barnabas, who belonged to the leadership in Antioch. And through this account, Barnabas is always named first because they knew Barnabas a lot more than Paul at the time, and Barnabas was older than Paul. They would report to their own church on what had happened at the council meeting. Okay, they'd go there, the letter would be presented to the elders, the letter would be read, then the letter would be discussed, then they would actually preach on the why behind the letter from Scripture. They also chose men from their own company who were church leaders at the mother church uh, in Jerusalem. They wanted some of their own to visit the sister church, to show their respect for the sister church, to show their love and unity with, the, with that church, <clears throat> and to increase the sense of importance of that decision. We're not simply sending back to you Barnabas and Paul, who are already on your session, they're part of your church leadership. Here's some people from our presbytery, uh, here's some people from our church, and they're going to talk to you too, to show you that we really love you, to show you that we're really united with you. They regarded the church in Antioch, which consisted of primarily of Gentile converts, as of equal importance to their own. These men would help Paul and Barnabas put an end to this heresy, and they would add weight to the letter that was sent. So the letter here is so important that they, they wanted chief men among their own congregation to take it with Paul and Barnabas in person. So we see here the importance of the communion of the saints. Though they may, um, there may be many churches, we are all one in Christ. There should be communion of the saints. There should be a willingness to discuss issues doctrinally with each other. And what's going on today where uh, you have people with an attitude and uh, full of pride and they're not willing to have harmony and discuss things scripturally. Uh, they have the spirit of Antichrist. They have the spirit of Rome. We must strive to have the same mind, the mind of Christ. We must strive for unity based on doctrinal integrity. And doctrinal unity, not pragmatism, not doctrinal pluralism, not the acceptance of heresy in the name of love. And if we do that, if we're willing to submit to Scripture, we can have true unity, biblical unity, Christian unity. Now, the men named are Judas called Bar Barsabbas and Silas. The name Barsabbas means uh, son of Sabbas. And scholars think that the name Sabbas could mean the, uh, the elder, or it could be interpreted as son of the Sabbath, meaning he was probably born on the Sabbath. So it's kind of a nickname. In the New Testament, this name only occurs here in Acts 123, where a man named Joseph Barsabbas is mentioned. And a number of commentators speculate that this may be, maybe this is his brother, but we don't know. The other man invited is Silas. Now, the name Silas is short for Silvanus. He is a recognized leader in the Jerusalem church, uh, verse 22, and he's identified as a prophet in verse 32. He's called a preacher in 2 Corinthians 1.19. He's going to accompany Paul on the second missionary journey, <clears throat> which is very important, verse 40, instead of Barabbas, uh, Barnabas, excuse me, Barnabas, who has a disagreement uh, with Paul over John Mark, and they separate over John Mark, who... Uh, Paul is upset that he had abandoned them on the first missionary journey. He doesn't want to take them along. And then he ends up hanging out with Peter, and he writes the Gospel of Mark. So he, he's a very, very important person. <clears throat> so they're going to travel through Syria, Cilicia, South Galatia, and on to Macedonia. And they're going to remain in Buria with Timothy 
Um, he will remain in Berea with Timothy after Paul departs for Athens and Acts 17.14. And then he's going to travel to Athens to be with Paul later, Acts 17.15. He will then be sent back to Macedonia on a special errand for Paul, 1 Thessalonians 1.2. He's going to rejoin Paul at Corinth, Acts 18.5. And his name is associated with Paul in two epistles, the two epistles written to Thessalonica from the city of Corinth. Now, Silvanus is mentioned also uh, in 1 Peter 5, 2, 5, 12, as the bearer of Peter's first epistle. So this guy got around. He was very important. Like Paul, he was a Roman citizen. His accompanying with Paul on the second missionary journey was providential. For as a leader from the Jerusalem church, he could really help Paul put the Judaizing heresy in its place. <clears throat> because he was from Jerusalem and Paul was from Antioch, they could present a united front against the circumcision party. Then fourth, we come to the letter itself. There is the introduction which tells us who the letter is from and who it is directed to. The apostles, the elders, and the brethren, to the brethren who were of the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Now, the greeting is different than we find in Paul's epistles and Peter's epistles, but does show some resemblance to James' epistles. It is significant that the apostles and elders place, um, places them on the same level as uh, Christian leaders meeting as a court. When they met as a court, the apostles did not have any more authority than the elders did. So this idea of diocesan bishops above the elders, above the pastors, the pastor of pastors, which is the Romanist view, which has traveled into Episcopalianism and, and uh, Methodism, totally unscriptural. They're equal. There's not one iota of thought that Gentile Christians have a... Uh, uh, have a second-class status or a lower status in the kingdom of God than Jewish Christians. <clears throat> the Jerusalem decree is sent to three separate cities or regions within the Roman province of Syria. So we see that there were a number of churches in this area, in these areas, and the decision of the court could be presented and read in each church. Many believe these churches were founded by Paul and others before his first missionary journey. So we have a decision of a court of multiple churches sent to multiple churches in a geographical area. Well, beloved, this perfectly comports with Presbyterian church government, doesn't it? It fits Presbyterian church government like a glove. It fits perfectly. But it contradicts congregationalism where the authority ends at each particular church. Congregationals believe that councils of various churches, they can meet. They can give advice. But their decisions have no binding authority at all. Their recommendations, their advice. They can only make recommendations. And they have no binding authority uh, behind those decisions. Note that in Acts 16.4, Paul and Silas, on Paul's second missionary journey, delivered the letter to the churches in southern Galatia. This indicates that Paul and Silas, who were at the Jerusalem conference, believed that the findings of the council were to be universally applied to all the churches, to every Christian church, not simply the churches in Syria. Now, why is Paul doing that? Silas, did, well, they want to protect the gospel. And then, of course, you have the book of Galatians, which is extremely strong against the Judaizers. <clears throat> the letter applies to all believers but is specifically directed to Gentile believers, those who were the target of the Judaizers' false doctrine. Doctrinal controversies are to be handled by church courts, and the purpose of declaring orthodox teaching and condemning false teaching is to protect the flock from false teachers, false shepherds, false prophets. And we would hope and pray that modern churches would do the same which they've done very deficiently in our generation. The way that the Federal Vision Heresy, the Auburn Avenue Doctrine was handled in the OPC and the PCA is just dreadful. 
It's a, it's a disgrace. And if Norman Shepard had been defrocked and excommunicated when he should have been, back in the 1970s, you wouldn't have this federal vision heresy out there like it is now. They could have nipped it in the bud, but they were cowards, and they had a false definition of love. And of course, they had this loose subscriptionism, which allows heresy to be in the church. Number two, the purpose of the letter is addressed in verses 24 to 26. Since we have heard that some who went out from us, that is, some professing Christians from the churches in Judea or Jerusalem, some went out from us, have troubled you with words unsettling your soul, saying, you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. It seemed good to us, being assembled with one accord, to send chosen men to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they make it perfectly clear that these false teachers were acting on their own authority. They were not sent on an official mission to teach this. They were acting on their own. They did not have the sanction of the apostles or the elders or the churches in Jerusalem. The leadership in Jerusalem immediately distances themselves from these heretics. The implication here is that churches should not pay any attention to self-appointed teachers. People just appear out of the blue from nowhere. Hey, I'm a teacher. Listen to me. I've got something new. You're going to love this. We shouldn't pay attention to such men. Men who aspire to ministry should present themselves before a qualified court for examination. If these men have presented their teachings to the local church for examination, they would have not, not have caused trouble in Christ's church and would, have been, uh, would not have been allowed to spread false doctrine. The issue of what one must do if the courts of professing churches are corrupt and seriously backslidden is a topic for another day. Now, I understand, I know the RPCNA, the corrupt court of the Great Lakes Gulf Presbytery, which is a thoroughly corrupt court, uh, would not license a man to preach the gospel uh, because he didn't celebrate Christmas. That's a true story. That happened oh, about a year ago. And that's just shameful. But that's a separate topic. Under normal circumstances, you submit to the, you go to a court, a qualified court, and you have to submit to what they say. One obviously cannot submit to a decision or to a doctrine that is heretical. Obviously, one must separate under such circumstances. Now, the letter acknowledges that the doctrines of the Judaizers upset the minds of the Gentiles in Antioch. The word translated, uh, troubled, or subverted, the old King James, is a very strong word in Greek. It means to dismantle or to, de to devastate. The false teachers wanted to strip away these Gentile Christians' faith and salvation through faith in Jesus alone, apart from the works of the law. So the teaching was shocking to these Gentiles who had been taught the truth, who had been taught and discipled that salvation was through grace alone, through faith alone. Now imagine some of you have been taught that and you're totally full of joy because you know you're a rotten, filthy sinner. You know you can never make it on your own. You can never do anything to please God. And then you're saved and you're happy. Oh, thank you, Christ. You've saved me a rotten, filthy sinner. Thank you. And then you're told something different that would be devastating to you. But thank God the apostles handled it properly. They were upset because they were hearing doctrine that they had never heard before. Doctrine that explicitly contradicted the gospel which they had been taught. It is bad that these Christians were troubled by false doctrine. But it is good that they knew enough of true doctrine, the true gospel, that they immediately became troubled in their minds and upset over what they were hearing. What is truly bad is when professing Christians hear false doctrine and are not troubled by it. Then you have a problem. When the Federal Vision heresy broke into the scene in 2002, many professing Christians, I would say probably most professing Christians, welcomed the heresy with open arms. They were not troubled by the theological poison of these false teachers in Louisiana, in New York, in Moscow, Idaho. They were not troubled by the heresies. But fortunately, many Christians were troubled and they took a stand for the true gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And these men who were preaching this heresy lost almost no members at all. Doug Wilson only lost a few families. The guy in Louisiana only lost a few families. I don't know what happened in Steve Slissel's church. But uh, it's good when you're troubled by heresy. You should be troubled by heresy. And it should force you to go uh, to the Bible and to go on the attack for the truth. The expressions that seem good to us being assembled with one accord indicates the unanimity of the council in Jerusalem. <clears throat> there were no dissenting votes among the voting members of the council. They want the recipients of this letter to note their unanimity. Unanimity on doctrinal issues is rare in courts today. Because churches have embraced loose subscriptionism and doctrinal pluralism. If you allow six different views of Genesis chapter 1 and 2 and 3, if you allow all these different views on Genesis, then you're going to get different views. If you say, no, we're just going to allow the biblical view, which is a six, day, six literal day creationism, if we're going to allow the biblical view, then that's what you're going to get. But when you allow heresy, you get heresy. In verses 26 and 27, they speak of the men who are sent to deliver the message, which we have already discussed. The only thing added is the statement that Barnabas and Paul have risked their lives for the sake of the, our Lord Jesus Christ. This refers to what happened on the recent missionary journey. Both men were persecuted and barely escaped with their lives, especially Paul, who was actually stoned and left for dead. The council is saying, we are impressed with their dedication and fervent service toward Christ, and you should be also, and listen carefully to everything they have to say. These are dedicated men to Christ. Number three, the council made it clear that the decision was a result of the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Verse 28 says, It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. When we consider the assembly, we see the Holy Spirit at work in two ways. A, the agreement offered against the Judaizers arose from the teaching of the Old Testament on the full inclusion of the Gentiles as full members in the church. Okay, we noted when we discussed this, there was a scriptural argument from the Old Testament. From, and he said, not prophets singular, prophets plural. So it was based on the teaching of Scripture of the Old Testament. B, the Holy Spirit's work is full. Uh, the Holy Spirit's work of revealing to Peter the necess necessity, due to the finished work of Christ, of including no, lar no longer regarding Gentiles as ritually unclean. Remember the vision. And then C, the Holy Spirit's baptism of Gentile believers, and is causing them to be pub publicly speak in tongues as a sign before Peter and the Jews present. And that really did it for Peter. How could we deny these people water baptism and full inclusion in the Church of Christ when the Holy Spirit, who is God, baptized them just as he did us in the beginning, and they're speaking in tongues just like us in the beginning? And then D, there's the illuminating work of the Holy Spirit upon the minds of the apostles and elders of the council so they could correctly understand and interpret Scripture as well as properly interpret the signs performed in their midst. And then number four. We come to the stipulations set forth in the decree. They are set forth in a tender, tender fatherly manner. They say we will lay on you no greater burden. The word burden looks back to verse 10, where the law is described as a yoke that could not be borne. It was a burden. It was a yoke. The Jews couldn't handle it. We couldn't handle it. The Gentiles are not to be burdened with a ceremonial law that has been abrogated, and they are not to try to attempt to be justified by the law, which is simply impossible. The rules set forth are called necessary or essential. Guided by the Holy Spirit, certain rules are set forth to maintain unity and harmony between Gentile and Jewish Christians during this unique period in redemptive history where you have a covenantal overlap. Here's the Old Testament flowing along. Christ comes. The New Testament comes in. Yet the gospel still hasn't reached all the Jews and hasn't reached the Gentiles yet. They don't know about the New Covenant coming in. And of course, they've been raised at the end of the Old Covenant their whole lives. You can't expect them to go uh, from the way they've been raised their whole life to going out and having lobster and bacon. You've got to give them time. And the Holy Spirit does that. These stipulations 
except obviously for fornication, which is a moral issue, have not been given as moral absolutes or moral positive laws that are universally binding on all Christians forever. They deal with a unique historical situation. The four stipulations are A, you shall abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and then from fornication or sexual immorality. <coughs> and as we noted, they're in a different order than... Uh, they took what James recommend, recommended and they organized it better. They put the ceremonial stuff, the, the positive laws for the Jews, they put that in the first three categories and they separate fornication out from it as separate. Now, we've discussed these things in detail in the past, so we're going to look at these recommendations. Um, uh, when we looked at the recommendations from James, they're going to be very brief. The first three things all have to do with foods regarded as unclean by the Jews. Now, obviously, if you've got Christian, Christians, Gentiles, and Christian Jews together, you don't want to offend your Jewish brothers, and that's what these are about. Now, many Christians regard the laws pertaining to the proper draining of blood as hygienic rules, health rules. But Gentiles have been eating bloody meat and blood for centuries without health problems. As long as it's, you butcher things quickly and properly and you don't let stuff sit around and you cook it properly. I mean, they have blood pudding in Scotland. It's disgusting. The draining of blood was out of respect for blood as life. Okay, these, these are ceremonial ordinances. They're not hygienic ordinances. It was a ceremonial rule designed to show respect for the sacrificial blood of the Messiah to come. Protestants, whether Lutheran, Reformed, or Presbyterian, have never regarded the blood laws as pertaining to today. They regarded them as uh, ceremonial in nature. Now, I know that some people still hold to these laws, like Rush Dooney did, and certain theonomists do, and so forth, but they're in the tiny, 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 tiny minority. The rule to abstain from things sacrificed to idols makes sense, because to eat of such things was regarded as honoring a pagan deity by the Jews in some sense. And they regarded it as improper to touch such stuff. Instead of offending the, Jew, the Jews who, believe, uh, who believed in Christ, find a butcher who does not sacrifice the animals to his favorite deity when he cuts its throat. And you have to understand they had butcher guilds and most things that you bought on the market had been offered to idols. Later on, Paul said, it doesn't really make any difference. We know idols don't exist, but you know, don't offend your Jewish brother. So we know that this is not a law that lasts forever. <clears throat> Paul explains the why behind this rule in 1 Corinthians 8, 1 to 13. Now he's talking about something slightly different, but the application is the same. Listen to what he says. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we have all, we have all knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing as yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, but there is only there is no other God but one. For even if the so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we live. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of the idol, until now eat, it is a thing offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat, we are the better, nor if we do not eat, we are the worse. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you <coughs> have knowledge eating in, uh, in an idol's temple, It'd be like a restaurant connected, a restaurant or something connected, to, uh, or a stand where they offered some meat. Will not the conscience of him who is weak and be emboldened to eat such things offered to idols? But because of your knowledge, shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Okay, so Paul is saying that we know that the idols really do not exist. But there are some weak Christians whose uh, conscience will be violated. 
Therefore, we are not to put a, a scandal on, a stumbling block in front of them that may cause them to sin, to violate their conscience. So how the meat was butchered is not really your concern, but such rules, uh, but we have to love our weaker brethren, so we have to take this into account. Now, as we noted in our earlier discussion, the word fornication may refer to some forms of sexual immorality uh, that were certainly unbiblical, uh, that was common among the Jews, that was not practiced, uh, that was common among the Gentiles, but was not practiced by the Jews. You know, things that were acceptable in Jew certain forms of incest in certain Jewish uh, Gentile communities were acceptable, that the Jews would find abhorrent. And Paul says, make sure you don't do these things. So he's really emphasizing fornication. If you read the epistles, fornication or sexual morality was a huge problem in the apostolic church. It was a huge problem. Things such as incestuous marriages or having a common law wife, uh, practices among the Gentiles that were unscriptural. And then number five, the letter ends with verse 29c. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. By observing these rules, the Gentile Christians would do well. That is, they would help maintain peace, unity, and harmony between Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians. The Gentile Christians are not to think of such rules <coughs> as helping them earn salvation. It has nothing to do with that, but as practical rules for fellowship. The Holy Spirit wants everything to be done decently and in order. He wants believers to cut each other some slack on non-essentials. He wants the strong to humbly bear with the weak. So consciences are not violated. That's all that's going on here. They're practical rules for a unique time in redemptive history. They don't really apply to us anymore, except for fornication, obviously. Now, if you have a guy who's converted to Christianity from Judaism, and he still thinks he must eat kosher, well, fine. He comes over by, by some kosher meat. A little more expensive, but it's generally of good quality. It's no big deal. But don't violate his conscience. And then we look very briefly. We're just going to touch on this and end this section, the results of the meeting. In verses 30 to 35, we are told the results of the meeting in Antioch. So when they were sent off, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the letter. When they read it, they rejoiced over its encouragement. Now Judas and Silas, themselves being prophets, also exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. And after they stayed there for a time, they were sent back with greetings from the brethren to the apostles. However, it seemed good to Silas to remain there. Okay, this is setting up the second missionary journey. Paul and Barnabas also remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many others also. In verse 30, we see that those of the council said goodbye to those given the task of distributing the letter in Antioch. They were sent off in an official manner with specific task. They assembled the Christians together in Antioch for the reading of the letter. And of course, the letter will be explained. When it comes to false teaching, every believer must be taught and warned. Now, this obviously is a very abbreviated account of what happened, but it really tells us what, what happened. Luke gives us the most important facts. When Paul and Barnabas together uh, with Barsabbas and Silas, they come to Antioch, they deliver the letter to the church session. That's the local court of which Barnabas and Paul were members. Then the session or local church court would have called a special church meeting. At the gathering of the special church meeting, the letter would have been read, the whole letter would have been read publicly. Then there would be uh, reports and exhortations related directly to the doctrinal controversy. So I would, I would expect gospel preaching and explaining why the gospel is true and what they were teaching is wrong. In verse 31, we see that the believers rejoiced over the contents of the letter. They were overjoyed by its encouragement. The Gentiles who did not receive circumcision, who had become Christians and joined the church solely on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ, were very happy that they would not have to be encumbered by the yoke of the law. The Gentile Christians, Gentile Christians saw firsthand that the views of Paul and Barnabas were the views of the whole council. Remember earlier, Paul and Barnabas had debated vigorously with these men and refuted them. 
The demands of the heretical Judaizers had been soundly rejected and defeated. It was a great meeting where Paul, Barnabas, Marsabas, and Silas all spoke and glorified the grace of God. So unlike many churches today, we do not see people complaining about the rejection and refutation of the false doctrine as being unloving or unecumenical. We don't see anybody complaining. Oh, how dare you say that these guys are bad, their doctrine's bad. The unity of the church is both Jew and Gentile was based on the uniformity of biblical doctrine and a true willingness to not uh, offend the Jewish believers on matters of food, not essentials. God was giving them time in that generation to adjust to the New Covenant era. In verses 32 and 33, we learn that Judas and Silas are prophets. They continued to teach in Antioch for quite some time. They were both fluent in Greek, and they were both great preachers. We would expect them to do some preaching. And then after a time, Barsabbas returns, Silas will stay. The expression in peace is a typical Jewish farewell greeting at that time. It was used when Jews met each other. Peace be unto you. Peace. Shalom. And it was used when departing. Here it has real meaning because the mission assigned to Paul, Barnabas, Silas, and Judas or Basabas was a complete success. There was doctrinal harmony between the Jewish and Gentile believers because the counselor synod had done their duty. And these men conveyed the truth of the letter and but they preached about the letter and they gave the message of the gospel, the true gospel against the false teachers. And then in verse 35, the section comes to an end by noting that Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch. Of course, Silas is there too. Preaching and teaching with many others the word of the Lord. So what do they do? They return to their work they were doing before they went on their first missionary journey. They went back to teaching. They were teachers in the church, teaching elders. And of course, we have apostle and one's an evangelist. Once again, we need to remind ourselves that Antioch, which was strategically placed at the beginning area of the Gentile world, the northern half of the Rome, it was the gateway to the northern half of the whole Roman Empire, was the center for missionary outreach of the Apostolic Church. And briefly, just very one, one little brief comment. The lesson that we have learned here about how church government should function is crucial. We need to follow it about how doctrine and other controversies should be resolved is exceptionally important. The message is simple, yet churchmen, in their sin and arrogance, repeatedly ignore it today. If somebody has a disagreement with the elders, listen to them. Debate it. If you're wrong, if you're celebrating Christmas and you're wrong, or you're acting like a pope and you're wrong, admit it and repent. Don't use your authority to squash their voice and drive them out of the church because you're an arrogant jerk, which is what goes on in Presbyterian circles today, to conservatives anyway. They're driven out of the church often by people who are simply unwilling to, to, to get rid of the Romanist trash that they've picked up over the years. So let's never forget it. We must not allow prelacy to take root. We must not allow loose subscriptionism and pragmatism to get a foothold. We must fight for what is right and imitate the apostles, imitate the apostolic church in these things. They did it properly. And they were far greater men than we are. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks for this excellent teaching. Your word is wonderful. And we need it. For without it we go astray. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for giving unity between Jews and Gentiles in your church. We thank you that we don't have to keep the law to be saved. We thank you that you've done away with the Old Testament shadows, the ceremonies that were burdensome. And we thank you that you have brought us into your church, your one true church, through faith. Lord, help us to be obedient. Help us to have church government that is biblical, that is fair, that is just, that is open. In Jesus' name.